Hello there, this is Ellen Friedman. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, panel. Uh, we are also grateful that uh, Buzzword set this up at a, a late hour of the day in, in, uh, in Europe, because it works well for those of us who are in the America's time zone. Uh, I'm here in the Bay Area in California. I'm here today with Lars Albertson, who is in Sweden. Uh, but the two of us are basically, hi Lars. Hi Alan, pleased to meet you. <laughs> pleased to see you. We're here to channel memories and, and and join all of you as though we're sitting at those wonderful big wooden tables and benches outside the main building at Berlin Buzzwords as we've done in previous years. And so I'm gonna use my imagination and say this cup of tea is my glass of Prosecco. I'm envisioning Yar uh, Lars has a beer joining all of you, our friends here. Uh, oops, let's see his beer, yes, <laughs> Star Wars beer. Joining all of you for a good chat as we would sit around these tables and take advantage of the fact that we have access to Lars and his expertise and uh, good and bad experiences. <coughs> uh, adopt these modern approaches to here to talk about data ops, about data engineering, about why these approaches can make a tremendous difference in terms of how you work and, and productivity in an organization. Also what some of the challenges are. And the good news is he also has some tips for how to overcome those challenges. Uh, we welcome all of you to bring your questions. I think the session is called Ask Lars Anything. And so well, he's in the hot seat. <laughs> uh, bring your questions uh, uh, to Lars and put those in the questions window. I think it will be the easiest way to do this. Uh, also, feel free to uh, bring your ideas, your comments, your suggestions. And I'm going to start off with some questions of my own for Lars. And we'll take more of your questions toward the end. We may interrupt partway through. Let's just see where this whole thing takes us. Now, I want to do a little more of a a formal introduction uh, uh, to Lars. And I realized one of the questions I should have asked him ahead of time is how to pronounce uh, the name of his company. <laughs> oh, I should introduce myself for a moment. Uh, uh, my role is principal technologist at Hewlett Packard working with HPE Esmeral Data Fabric. Some of you will have known that technology uh, was built on what was formerly the MapR uh, data platform before MapR was acquired by HPE. So I tend to focus more on the data side of things. I think Lars looks not only at the data, but especially at computation, but mainly he's got that huge amount of real world experience. So Lars, my first questions for you are, how do you pronounce your company correctly? Uh, you are the founder, I believe, and the, the CEO of this company. This is a long question, it's got four parts. <laughs> and tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing now, but also what brought you to this? What were the, the, the journey that got you there? Yeah, um, well, I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't uh, take my, my whole life history here, but there, there are a couple of milestones who, who took me here and and the company name is Skling. By the way, mm. I realized that every every company name has has some kind of drawback. You know, it means something dirty in some language or, or something. In my <laughs> case, it, it's or in our case, it's people don't know to pronounce whether to pronounce it with a soft C or with a hard C, but it's a hard C. <laughs> so mm. Skling. Um, and what what brought me here? Uh, there are a couple of milestones in my career that that, that like brought brought me here. Uh, the, the first one was was in two thousand seven uh, when I uh, got lucky and was able to join Google as as one of the first engineers in Stockholm. And uh, we built uh, what was called Google Talk Video at the time, the, the first video conferencing at, at Google. We're now in the third generation, I think, which is Meet, and uh, that was revolutionary or, or um, they became a realize or an eye opener for me and uh, not because of video conferencing but because i realized how much value you can get out of the data uh, google sort of invented big data and they were the only ones doing it at the time um so as when i left google i tried to gravitate towards data as much as possible. And what I didn't know when I was at Google was that, was that Spotify had just installed their first Hadoop cluster back in 2007. Uh, it was just five machines beneath the window. 
And uh, so I joined a few uh, Spotify a few years later and built uh, sort of one of the generations of, of the Spotify internal data platform, the, the one where we managed to go from just a few teams being able to use Hadoop and use data to democratizing it, it in, the, in the whole company. And, and the use of data completely exploded at Spotify afterwards. And there's still sort of the, the uh, leader in terms of data maturity and data usage in, in Scandinavia. Um, I, my mission ever since has been to spread the value, the superpowers that, that like data and AI brings to, to, uh, to companies, to uh, Swedish or and Scandinavian companies that, that I like, where, whose values I sympathize with and that, that uh, I believe are, do, are doing good things. Uh, for 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 the society at large or for the environment, uh, not not necessarily non-profit, but just have, have good values that I that I sort of agree with. And I for for a number of years I tried to do that as a freelance consultant, uh, and I realized there is so much, only so much you can do because success with data is not about the the technology or the tools or the machinery. And usually I was brought in to build machinery, uh, basically and build a data platform for us. Uh, uh, so forth, but it lies in the in the ways that you work with data, in how you collaborate, and, and how you extract value, and so forth. So, so I, I was often accompanied and saying, "Well, I can build things for you, but you actually need, you know, an organizational culture, an agile culture, someone to transform the way that you work, and you, and that's what what effectively what limits you." Uh, so uh, we are now trying a, a different approach where we. Uh, collaborate uh, with companies, but, but in a different form. So we're providing what we call data value as a service. And it's, a, it's essentially a, a jointly operated data factory uh, where uh, we help clients extract value from their data uh, by uh, channeling their data to our platform and we build the pipelines and refine it. And if the the domain is, is complex, uh, then we, uh, we collaborate very closely with the domain experts. And then we, we, have this, uh, we run this factory as, as a sort of a refinery. Uh, so you can view it as, as the, uh, the externalized uh, or the outsourced data team or, or data department. And then we channel back refined data. So from, from raw events, we channel back uh, like recommendation indexes or a fraud detection service or reports or anything from mundane simple re uh, things like reports to, to machine learning. So it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid between a consultant because we do customized things and a, a product company because we have our platform and we run everything internally on that platform, but we don't actually sell it. And so making this more generalized for the audience is uh, so that they can see themselves in this, the kinds of challenges that people might have with data that they would either have to solve themselves or they might go to to you and your company uh, for those services what would be the the motivations what would be the moment that that uh, a company says we need to do this whether they do it with you or you know figure out a way to do it themselves yes uh so the uh one of the challenges for us is to find sort of humble companies uh <laughs> because uh, this is so popular nowadays, right? And and people think, how hard can it be? And, and then they employ a couple of data scientists or, or a couple of years ago, we used to have these giant Hadoop or data lake projects and, and they became visible failures. Now people have AI projects instead. And uh, so and lots of companies tend, tend to think that this is not so hard uh, and, and we can easily build some, some uh, technology and do it uh, but it turns out like for example lean transformations it's not very easy to do and, and most people fail so quite often the companies that come to us are the ones that know that they cannot compete for data engineers data scientists and so forth uh, on the market so what uh, our first customer was a was a big retail chain. Uh, their IT department was like twenty six people or something, and they didn't really have a. a they had an analyst or two, uh, so they had nothing to compete with against the banks and insurance companies and so forth. They were uh, screaming for the same talent. So then we were a, a suitable solution, and now we have um, we have care. Uh, one client in, in the elderly care business also uh, 
quite humble with, with their uh, capability and and I just spoke uh, earlier today with a with a mining company also not data as their their core business so so it's it's typ that's typically divide right if you're a bank or a telco you, your data is your core business and then then they tend to have the ambition to to do it themselves uh, and but that also means that they realize that maybe they don't know the way forward, uh, right? So they often come uh, with an idea that we have data and it has potential, but first they need help in, uh, you know, workshopping their way forward to, to the most uh, useful ideas and so forth. And uh, that's when, you know, we contribute with the, with the the way of working is important because I've seen so many data projects fail because they, they are driven by, you know, pour the data in the data lake and then we hope so that some magic happens and so forth. Uh, but what I've learned in working with successful data companies is that uh, success comes from being driven by use case and being driven by business value and working your way backwards. So, so, the, uh, so it's, it's often as much that they need help with uh, with these ways of working and how to fit, how to think about business value and data as it is uh, with the technology and the actual execution. So, given what you just described, and I've uh, by the way, audience, I've just tried sticking a question in the in the chat or the the question window myself <laughs> to see if I know how to do this and make sure I see your questions. Um, so, I've made a note to self here. Let's ask Lars. The, the issues that you're describing, and I, by the way, I love your comment about your in search of the, the humble company, the humble person. <laughs> um, but they, they, may be, they may be humble or they may need to be humble regardless of the size of the company or the particular sector. Uh, I would think the kinds of issues that you're talking about really come across for anyone who's trying to extract value from data and either haven't built their own team yet, aren't prepared to build their own team, you know, have tried it, but haven't been really as successful as they wanted, or have a huge team, but know that they there are approaches that can make them much more efficient. And so am I right in thinking it's not a particular size company, it's a, a situation that can... can cross it, it's a situation, yes. Uh, I... I I've also had conversations with very large companies where the uh, where product managers are uh, aware that they could do more, right? And they want to build data-driven products. Maybe they come from a more data mature company earlier, but they and they have a you know a lake and a team and, and might not be delivering what they need. Uh, so and and that makes them reach out externally for help, just as they might take in, a, in a, a, a niche consultant, they might uh, partner with us. For the medium companies, partnering with us is a sort of a strategic uh, decision, right? We become the team that builds the data platform and, and the data lake and so forth. And uh, although we do occasionally do smaller, you know, one-off little things as, as a as an early start, it, you need some kind of size to motivate building up a, a lake and a platform. Yeah. And so I would think even for people who do eventually, they either want to use a service like this so that they don't have to build it themselves, or if they are planning to build it, it certainly could work better uh, to first get some success under their belt. You know, I, I think there's a, a great lesson to watch how something is done well, uh, even if you plan to do it you know, yourself later so you can understand what works and what doesn't. And it also, you know, has you, uh, has you in, in motion, uh, uh, kind of. Absolutely. Know, and it's the fastest way to learn, right? I, I have been with so many developers that come into to the, to the day, big data world and, and they have a background from, from software engineering or from analytics or, or data science or something. And then, uh, the, you know, the first three months, they are confused, uh, not by the, necessarily by the complex technology, but the new ways of working. Uh, and, uh, and then after six months, they, they, are, uh, they, they sort of grasp the concept and they are ready to teach the next person coming mm -hmm. in. 
And there's no if more efficient way to learn that than to work with people who've done it a long time in production, in sharp, uh, uh, real reality. And something that I have very front of, very front of mind, um, because I've been uh, working with this a lot, uh, working with the, the people who uh, are using our HV data fabric, Esmeralda data fabric. Uh, also, Ted Dunning and I just finished another of these short books uh, called AI and Analytics uh, at Scale. And one of the issues that we bring up, and I, I think this underlies what you're saying, is that some people aren't necessarily looking for a solution because they don't even think a better way to do something is possible. Or a different way to put it is just because they've put something together and it's working today, it doesn't mean it's working well. And more importantly, it doesn't mean it will scale and scale with not just larger amounts of data, but different applications uh, have the flexibility to do new things without interruption or without having to re-architect. And then that leads uh, co companies and especially IT to just say no <laughs> every time a, a new idea comes. So sometimes it kind of looks like things are working, but it's really missed opportunities. And I think you're talking about either using services like your company or building services like that into a company so that that greater efficiency and, and, and being scale efficient and making use of things like data ops um, can actually make it possible not only do what you're doing today better, but say yes to to new things does that does that fit with your experience absolutely um and when you look at it it's usually the uh, it's usually conway's law it's sort of the organization of the of the company that's reflecting in the products and reflecting in the flow of data so i um i wrote a blog post i think it was two years ago i was going to shop something at ikea i'm in sweden i shop furniture at ikea uh, and uh, and i went through the website you know and searched for the thing results if they had just ranked by popularity i would have been much faster and i the, when i clicked on the thing there was no cross links to the to the relevant information and so forth and you could see in this experience right with in e every single step they sort of fail to match my expectations of them showing the right data, not because they were not able to or because it wasn't there, but because I could see a, a, a boundary between teams inside the organization, right? Here was a search team and here was a, the catalog team and here was the checkout team uh, and so forth. Uh, and you could see that there is so much potential in, in cutting down the friction to, to more revenue if you just focus on not acting so no artificial intelligence i call the blog post uh, that i wrote uh, i wore artificial stu stupidity because that was what is all about you already have the information about my address just put it in the field right i don't have, i don't want to type it <laughs> uh, and um, and then six months passed and then i checked it went there again and they had redesigned the whole thing and made this really smooth transition oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was user customer oriented and i was like yes <laughs> you grasped it now well, i love this comment that you just made i haven't heard anybody say it that way but it's just beautiful the sense that you have that in this case the first experience a frustrating uh user experience but you can see in there you can see those barriers between teams uh because you had the experience to know the difference of it's kind of working or it's working well. So let's take that moment and sort of pivot here and, and let's jump in more deeply into uh, talking about what, what data ops actually is. And what I mean by it may be a little different than what you mean by it. And it has become a kind of a buzzy term. So I'm just gonna throw this out for the audience. You'll hear data ops, dev ops, ML ops, I loved a term that Lars did in a, in a comment back to me, the, the everything ops, all the other ops. <laughs> and I just have two, two suggestions as we have Lars jump more deeply into this, uh, but for the audience. Don't be overly distracted by the exact definition. Let's take data ops, exact definition. What I mean by it, what he means by it, maybe slightly different. Don't get lost in fine point, you know, we're, we're not a, a third grade teacher here. We, we don't have to have kids write out a definition. Uh, 
So don't get lost in the definition, but at the same time, because these words have gotten kind of latched onto by marketing departments and so forth, and they're very buzzy, excuse me, buzzwords, uh, <laughs> it also don't discount them because there is enormous value in these approaches, the, the, the kind of overlapping approaches of, of data ops in particular and all the, the different ops. Uh, the ideas behind them and executed well can make a tremendous difference in organizations and how they work in the productivity in the user experience, as Lars has just described as you began to see a, a transition in how things work. So uh, with that in mind, launch us into what is data ops? Uh, what kind of problems do they solve? Um, now, now you got me curious. Can I hear your definition? <laughs> <laughs> well, mine is much more simplistic. And remember, I'm the one that communicates with people about these things. You're the one who actually goes in there in the real world, rolls up your sleeves, put your hands in and, and helps people build the systems. Uh, and also, I have a very data centric point of view because I've worked four years with the, the data fabric technology and the people who are trying to bring data together on that. So with that in mind, data ops to me is an approach that is, I, I look at kind of the human cultural side of it and the specifically with regard to data, but very much what you said of that breaking down these walls between teams. And I have a little figure I've used in a couple of books and things I've written. So you have to imagine I'm drawing it here in the air. You have the different departments uh, within a company and things tend to get compartmentalized. You know, do, are you the, the database person? Are you the machine learning person? Or, you know, are you in IT, whatever. Um, but it, with a data ops approach, you kind of think of a team cross cutting with cross functional skills and not just touchy feely words, but literally the person sitting in the seat who, who engineers the data, who collects the data, who, uh, processes it, who finds it, who stores it, who handles it for data versioning. If you're doing machine learning, the person who's actually building the model, hopefully the people who are talking to the domain experts. So all this is done, set into appropriate context. The people who are going to deploy things, or it doesn't have to be machine learning and data ops, anybody's working analytics, whatever they're doing with data, extracting value, who's, who's just determining how people share data, all of that everybody's got a role and they can be expert in the thing that they do. But if you build that cross-functional team, they're focused on a shared goal. And at the human level, it can mean things as simple as, I have my role to play, you have your role to play, but if you ask me to do something, it's not like you're asking a favor of me to process or get this data for you. It's, we're all you know, rowing in the same boat and going the same direction. And I think that changes how people feel about it, certainly changes the communication lines that go across the team toward the goal as opposed to constantly up to, you know, some other manager and that can really slow things down. So that's a, I think a very small aspect of it, but that's kind of my slice through it. Yeah, uh, we are in, in essentially in complete agreement. I, I, I think that the, the uh, important aspect of, of, of data ops is the human side. I, I'd like to take a, like a historical perspective on it uh, that goes back to, to the 70s. There was this guy called um, Roy, and Roy, uh, the, the water for paper. Uh, back in, I think it was 1970. Um, and uh, he, he wrote this paper and which was an observation of how people were, were working at the time. And it's, he said, it seems to follow this, uh, this like linear engineering process that we all know with, with you know, design uh, or requirements and design and, and coding and, and uh, quality assurance and, and uh, deployment and so forth. <clears throat> and then, uh, and at the end of the paper, he, he, like, he said, this is probably not a good idea. And I have some suggestions here for improvements. And he started scratching on, on, on Agile. But people read this paper and says, yes, that's what we do. We, we now have a method. Let's call it waterfall. And there we were. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, that was a completely compartmentalized, right? You threw things over the wall to the, to the next stage all of the time. And eventually somebody figured out that, hey, maybe we shouldn't throw things over the wall to the QA people. Let's work together with them. Uh, like, uh, and that was called extreme programming because it was such an extreme idea. And then uh, people realized, hmm, maybe we should like, uh, you know, 
have the design and coding be intermingled and, and iterative and figure out what people want. And, and, and that was called Agile. It, it's not another set of people that, that are, are working together. And then it went, eventually when we reached operations, it was called DevOps because we were mm -hmm. developers were working with operations. And now uh, when, when sort of big data entered the, the scene, uh, we started working, uh, we started throwing things out and then measuring and bringing back the measurements to affect the design, right? Uh, and so big data is not about technology, it's about a new way of, of working together towards multiple disciplines towards the same goal. And then when that, that reached out to operations as well, we got data ops, and then we throw in the data scientists, and then we got ML ops. So all of these like shifting left uh, things are all, all about getting people with different skill sets and different mindsets to work together towards the same goal and, and explicitly be very explicit about this same goal. Uh, it used to be like development and QA had completely different goals, right? One was to produce bugs, the other was to, was to squash or, or find the bugs. And operations also, they didn't want any deployments the, the, because that would risk their stability and their bonuses and, and so forth. Uh, and late, very late to the game, we have security who, who's been uh, uh, detached forever. Like, But now we're seeing some DevSecOps and, and, and things are, are, are shifting left there as well. So it's, it, it's really on the human side. And then... Uh, if you, if you start there and work towards the same goal, then there are things that you need to do that you perhaps didn't think about doing before, like measuring quality of things, measuring data quality for the benefits of, 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 of the people doing quality assurance or, or the people who care about the, the machine learning models working in production and so forth. So it affects the activities and processes and, and tooling, but it's really this, uh, this aligned goal that, that sort of the, the gist of the, of the dogs. And I it, I really like the way you put that this early, starting with the, the waterfall stage, this idea of throwing things over the wall. Uh, and, and you're really saying, stop, you know, pull, pull down the wall and <laughs> hand things, because it's not a throw it over the wall and, you know, hope a miracle happens. <laughs> and there's no no feedback about, you know, the, these things are, are should be fluid, I think, from what you said. It, it has been like that for when, when data science first came in, right? They were writing their models in Python, throwing them over the wall, got translated to Java, throwing over the wall to operations and so forth. And, and that uh, creates very slow cycles. So, so a, a data ops and ML ops is really a key success factor to, to uh, succeeding with data or succeeding with machine learning. It's absolutely necessary to have in order to have sustained success with data and machine learning. So uh, you saw me just move a piece of paper here. I had a little note uh, to remind myself in some of our conversations, uh, and I want to make sure we have time to hit all of this, but uh, you've reminded people that in uh, Google had defined in ML ops kind of three levels of maturity. Uh, uh, zero is you're doing it with a, a, a stick and a and a and a rock. No, I'm sorry, that's <laughs> manual. Uh, <more> or less. <laughs> uh, level one is you're beginning to build an ML pipeline. Level two, uh, CID, CD, you're you're doing continuous integration, continuous deployment for pipeline automation. And I think that that style, it's not exactly that same thing, but that level two uh, kind of approach or mindset uh, sounds a lot like things that I've heard you say or seen seen you write about the kinds of services that you're bringing to people, but to do this within the the data ops world uh, to get into that style. Do, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, we, I have realized that we come from a when I say we here, the, our company and, and the, you know, the, the general uh, sphere of, of people in Stockholm that, that uh, I've worked with and so forth, we come from a, a fairly different uh, direction with a different angle uh, on working with data and data engineering than, than most of the people that I meet. Uh, because when uh, we adopted Hadoop very early. And Hadoop was, was really primitive uh, at the time. It could only do a few things like MapReduce and store lots of data and, and, and uh, a NoSQL store and so forth. 
And that really forced us into regarding these data problems as software engineering problems, right? And, and towards a very high degree of automation. And it enforced the functional paradigm, but on an architecture level, the data sets are immutable because there is no way to, to uh, edit them anyway. Uh, so we ha you have to do express things in functional transformations that which is the only thing you can do with MapReduce, right? And um, that was lucky because we were, th these are some of the key points in, in, in successful data ops is to uh, adopt these, these principles of functional paradigms of, of um, immutability, functional transformations, workflow orchestration to keep the whole thing uh, together and uh, retrying everything with pull so that it's naturally stable and, and so forth. And we got a few things right by uh, creating Luigi, the first, uh, first sort of modern workflow orchestration, which has made, a, which was the key thing that made us a scale to, to thousands of, of pipelines. And uh, nowadays there are so many things, right? That you can choose from. And uh, they are not pushing you as an adopter today, they are not pushing you towards the, the seeing the whole problem as software engineering and, and uh, towards high degrees of automation they, because there is no money there. The vendors all go to meet you where you are, right? Uh, uh, what's your process? Uh, okay, you are, you, you're used to SQL uh, databases and mutable tables and so forth. Okay, we'll, we'll tack this thing onto Hadoop or to the cloud so that you can keep your workflows, but you can still buy our thing. And thereby they're eroding the whole value because the whole value wasn't changing your workflows. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, so now I went on a little rant here, but this is some of the, the, the sort of misconceptions that, that I see. And this is, I, I believe, uh, this... Um, we came from, from a very highly automated uh, environment, and this makes us view data and working with data very differently from the, from the adopters today. So, uh, by the way, I liked your rant. <laughs> so I have, I have a few notes here of some questions I want to ask, and I just start reshuffling the cards. Because I want to take, take us where you took us just now with this little this little rant and two, two ideas. So um, I, I think a key idea for people to take away from this is the sense of, yes, the shared goal, yes, the cross-functional team, but also what you just touched on, this sense of uh, why it matters to automate some of these processes and, to, and, and how to automate them and how to automate them well, the immutable input, immutable output, why those kinds of approaches are good. And at first glance, it can sound like that then gives people less flexibility, but it actually gives them more flexibility, I think, because if you build the basic logistics more effectively, then it's easier to, to make changes, to add new things in, because not everything is having to be done one step at a time. Is that, is that true? It's basically about uh, pushing the, the cost down of your operations and your toil and of the, uh, the, the cost of running new experiments, because you need to run experiments and, and sometimes succeed, sometimes fail in order, in order to, to get forward. That, that's uh, one of the things that, that uh, Jeff Bezos uh, brings out when, it, when asked about Amazon's success. We, we were able to do a thousand experiments in, instead of a hundred experiments, and that may, makes a lot of difference. Um, so one way to look at it here is, is uh, what I, there are three phases that I call of, of any human activity that I call like muscle powered and mechanized and industrialized. Uh, so if you look like forestry, you can have a handsaw and, uh, or an ax to cut your tree down and then you get a chainsaw and it, you still you, you as a human, uh, yeah. but you now you have a power tool. And then the next step is, is forestry machines where, where there's quite not so much human involvement, but the, the machine sort of does all of the work. Uh, and in every activity that you can find, like transportation, food, there, there is an equivalent three phases of, of evolution. And uh, the, the corresponding for data is spreadsheet is the muscle powered thing, right? That, that the human essentially does all of the things. And the data warehouse era is the, is the epitome of, of, uh, or the crest of, of the uh, power tools era where, it's, where it's, everything is controlled by humans. 
uh, and with little automation, uh, but it's it's sort of steered by the analyst usually for for BI purposes. So what what uh, and Google uh, in the early two uh, noughties took us into the into this industrialized era where uh, where humans no longer work with the actual data. Right? They work with a process that that transforms the data. Just like the you know in the Toyota factory, there's there's very little humans that actually touch the car. Primarily, it's it's machines that that, that, that touch the car, with some exceptions, of course. Right? Um, and but the majority of companies are remain in this mechanized uh, stage. And only the big tech companies, like we in Scandinavia, we have like four or five companies perhaps that are mature in this industrialized stage. I know there's a lot more. Uh, Silicon Valley is is, uh, is uh, a number of years ahead of us here, um, but the majority of companies are are, are in the uh, in the power tools stage, and that's where the the, the revenue and and the money is. Uh, so that's what what the what the vendors sort of go for, but the or the cost of running things is is several orders of magnitude between the muscle powered and, and the uh, and the mechanized and between the mechanized and the uh, and the industrialized and uh, people don't realize how big these differences are. But if if you I've, I've talked to lots of like bank telcos and so forth mm -hmm. here in Sweden and and when I ask them so so your analytics department or your, your data warehouse like how how many data sets does it produce each day and they, they might have you know 80 people working with, with, with BI or analytics and they say oh well we produce like 500 uh, different reports or, or things for dashboards or, or whatever each day right and then you go to Spotify and and they are producing a, a few hundred thousand data sets per day right so so it's it's like three orders of magnitude uh, mm -hmm. And then you go to Google, and, and they are not they are rarely official with these things. But five years ago, they said they were producing 1.6 billion data sets per day, right? So so people think that oh well maybe ten times more, but like thousands of times more, right? And then the cost goes down, for, yeah. right? You, uh, obviously, they don't have like tens of thousands or more people, but the cost of running a thing goes down, and you spread the the, the knowledge and the ability in the organization, and yeah. then people. Uh, can do new things, right? So, so if the cost is very high, you can only do the most valuable things, like like counting your revenue or or your uh, marketing, uh, steering your marketing decisions and so forth. Uh, but then it goes down, and then you can do things like A/B testing and uh, and product uh, insights and so forth. And if it goes further down, you get to the machine learning. That that's usually the part with the lowest return of investment. So you really have to push things further down in order for that. To be like available to you to, to get to get sustainable uh, ROI for machine learning. I love to hear you say this. I, I wrote I don't know a year ago, six months ago, an article for CIO.com called "Can You Afford Innovation?" Exactly. And and also with the the things that you know I've I've written or said with uh, with uh, Ted Dunning, who's the CTO for Data Fabric here at HPE, uh, so many times uh, looking at. This question, exactly what you just said, of uh, we, we, by the time you were looking at machine learning and AI, these are um, uh, exploratory approaches. They're speculative. And the potential payoff uh, for those approaches that happen to hit right and work are enormous. And um, enormous, not just in terms of money, revenue changes, you can do different things, move at a different speed, but also enormous in terms of literal literal payback, but it, it's not, you start a project and you just guarantee on this date, you know, it's it's paying back. They are uh, speculative. And so if you lower that uh, ent entry cost, because for example, you're sharing data or because your overall operation costs are less, or you have that ability uh, to innovate, uh, it costs, the, the, the cost of trying it is so much less, you can try more things and the likelihood of hitting the one that's gonna pay off goes up. I think that's a real key to people who say, you know, does AI bring real value or, or, or does it not? Well, it very much depends on those kinds of approaches. And if you have built in a way to take action, you know, again, these things are not magic. And so I think your, your kind of operations extend not just to the, the goes ins, <laughs> But what happens to the goes outs? How do you how do you deliver 
insights from data, but then is that tied again, those, those walls between teams? Is it tied to either a, a human action or an automated or machine action, but something that actually you know, it carries that into uh, into the real world. So I'm just thrilled to hear you say that. Well, yeah, we're nearing the end of our time. So I want to jump in and just ask you completely for, well, first of all, if there's, if there's something you want to tell us or a question you want to ask, ask your own question, but here's my question for you. Sure. What, is you know so I'll, I'll i'll give you a plug i think the one of the best advice people can do if they want to try these approaches is contact you <laughs> and, and talk about it but say they're doing it for themselves what advice do you give and let's say if you're the uh the developer the 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 engineer the data engineer hearing this um or any other persona you want to ad advise, but what is the practical advice? Uh, first of all, to be able to tell whether, is, is your organization already doing this? Or are they kind of look like they're doing it, but you know, what are the hints that it's not, they're not, they haven't really tapped in. And then if, if they do feel like they want to make these changes, how do they, you know, what steps, what are the practical start today steps for people to take? Yeah. So uh, the question, are you, are you doing it? Uh, you, can, uh, you can find an answer to that by, by measuring agility, right? The, uh, I'm sure you and, and some of the listeners are aware of the DORA report, the DevOps report, and, uh, and the Accelerate book, which I recommend everyone to read. Um, they, uh, they measure agility in terms of, of, of operations and DevOps, right? And, and, one of the, and, and, and they measure reliability and a whole bunch of other things. But one of the measurements of, of, of agility is how long does it take you to get an idea out into production, right? Or line of code out into production. And the, uh, the elite uh, minutes and uh, the, the uh, trail, trailers, you know, six months, which is what it used to be like. Uh, and uh, you can measure similarly in data agility. Like if I have an idea, of how to use these three pieces of data that are spread uh, throughout the company for, for uh, fraud detection or whatever. How long does it take me to get that idea out into production? Well, that's, that's at least six months in, in most companies. Uh, and uh, what is blocking you, right? Is, is, uh, are questions that you can ask in order to, to figure out how to bring that agility down. Or if you have data flows, uh, uh, and uh, is sort of have got, gotten to some kind of level of maturity. What does it take to uh, change these data flows? Uh, so I threw out a, a poll on, on Twitter today, right? If you would change the meaning of one field, how does fr from uh, early up upstream in your data pipelines, how long does it take until that change has propagated? Right? A, a very trivial change, and uh, the majority of answers was was more than six months. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. We had these fields uh, at Spotify that we can get rid of for years. Uh, but that is, those things are, are, are slowing you down, right? And, and those, they uh, slow down innovation. They, the things you can't get rid of, accumulate tech yet and so on. But the, but the ability to innovate is more important than the, the ability to clean up your debt. So how, so if you are in an organization and you say, this sounds good to me, and uh, I want to, you know, I'm going to take that step. What are some, yeah, that was a great description of how can you tell, are you already there? Uh, and some of this, you know, people may say it sounds good, but they're not the ones, you know, pulling the strings to say, now we're going to go in this, in this new direction. So how can people begin to um, get either, either take initial steps themselves or, or, attract other people in the organization to to say yeah they're really there's a valuable other approach or what you said earlier you know, that that uh, motivate people toward this desire for for automation for a data ops type approach and this is where when we get to you don't need me to build technology you need an organizational coach and so so uh, what I would say these days if you've asked me if five years ago i would have said well you know build these things on, a, on in the cloud build a spot cluster or whatever that that doesn't matter at all 
what you need to do is to figure out what what, what would the end goal look like, right? What 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 would, what would a piece of success look like? Well, and then and then you go backwards from there and say we have these data sources and and what does it take to bring them and bring and get our computation in production to to fulfill the end goal. And then you bring in tools such as like value stream mapping, uh, which is a way to figure out where you spend your time when when you're developing a, a product. Right? And and in most value stream maps, you you the the uh, result is that you realize that you spend one percent of your time doing re the real work, the coding or, or the testing or whatever, and then you spend ninety nine percent of your of your time waiting for people, or waiting for an approval, or waiting for, for somebody else to put it in a backlog and your priority and so forth. And if you get to 10%, then you're, you're elite, awesome, right? So most organizations don't, don't get, go beyond the sing, single digits. And uh, then you have to find someone who can actually change real things, like change the shape of your teams and the shape of your organization. Uh, so it's really a uh, the challenges are, are, are leadership and uh, organizational the way you work more than anything else. I have the impression. I wonder if this fits your experience. <clears throat> that one problem is that people. I'm trying to think of a a polite way to say this. <laughs> oh, so go bad. ahead. We, you know. We're, <laughs> We're not so polite here in Scandinavia. Just the polite. only American way, I'll just blurp it out there, is that sometimes, and maybe I don't know if it's the individual engineer or the team lead or the people higher up in the organization, but they hear about a new approach and they want they were, they don't want to miss an opportunity. They don't want to miss you know they don't want to be behind the curve. They're trying to be competitive, um, but they sometimes approach this. I mean, even subconsciously, by they want to keep their old assumptions. So they they don't they, because not that they're defending them. They, it, it's not even a question. I mean, they haven't realized that that's that's framing what they do. And they say, "Give me that new technology. I'll buy that new technology." And you know, I work for a company that's selling selling software technology. So, you know, yay, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I know I'm contradicting your, your, your agenda here, but I would say don't buy any new technology because that's the, oh, no. the thing that makes a difference. Well, I do think it, the, the people who you, well, even who, who buy our wonderful technology, we really see a difference in people. And with this part of the, the, the book that Ted and I just did, it's got like I don't know, 18 or 20 use cases. Talking about people who uh, don't just get this technology, because you do need some fundamental tools that give you the opportunity to democratize data and share. And I mean, then that's fundamentally what this this data fabric does, but that people who, the innovation needs to be not just the people who build the innovative technology. Innovation to work has to be, do the people who use it, do the users have vision? Yeah. And so do they see the possibilities? Do they change that style? Do they step back and say, you know, I've been accepting trade-offs that I, I, you know, I'm limited by my technology, but I'm also limited by my worldview. I, I'm not trying to build a, a, what I call a comprehensive data strategy. I think you've talked about a, 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 a data ops manifesto, you know, it, it, that people have to say, I'm going to use this in a new way. It's not just buy the tool and plug it in. I mean, they buy the tool, plug it in, they may get a little advantage, but they're missing a huge opportunity if they haven't, you know, plugged themselves in <laughs> and, and basically said this, there's a different way to do things. I'm sorry, but now I ranted on my, that was my soapbox about uh, uh, it. makes sense. Uh, the, this is very subconscious, uh, uh, I find. It's, it's, it's very rarely conscious decisions. Oh, by the way, I should give credit uh, for the Data Ops Manifesto is, is written by data, a company called Data Kitchen in Boston. Who is, they provide great resources on, on Data Ops if, if anybody is interested in reading more. Um, so it, it's it's really subconscious, uh, and I, I'd like to correct my my statement earlier that that uh, technology does matter in the sense that 
some technology affects the way that you work, right? It changes the way that you work. Uh, and I, I brought up Hadoop as an earlier example of something that transformed the way that we work, but we weren't aware of it, right? It was completely subconscious and accidental. So it was pure luck that somebody thought it would be fun to install a Hadoop cluster in 2007 before there was any business idea whatsoever or, or reason whatsoever. Well, I just insert, or technology may be limiting the way you yes. work. I mean, you do need, the technology doesn't solve the problem, but you do need to know if it's imposing limits that wouldn't let you do the kinds of approaches that you're, you're going for. Uh, and everything of this happens subconsciously, right? Uh, yes. One other enabling technology that changes the way you work is the cloud, of course, because you don't have to go uh, go and ask for machines and so forth anymore, and that really changes the way you work. Uh, and and in some ways, it it does. Uh, it's in a destructive way, or maybe not appropriate for you. Like for for example, Git and GitHub has uh, the popularization has made every company. Or, or lots of companies work like they were an open source project. The, the, but the difference is that in an open source project, you don't have trust between people. So, yes. so suddenly companies work as if there were no trust between the different teams, right? And, and that's <laughs> not, not necessarily a good thing. No, no. <laughs> so uh, we have just a few minutes left. I think a closing question for you is, are there uh, particular resources that you want to share or point people to. Uh, I, I'll make an offer on your behalf. I'll tell you every conversation with Lars I've ever had in my life, I've come away uh, really revved up, learning something, looking at things in a new way. So I hope people will reach out and, and contact you. But are there particular pointers either to actions, approaches, or some resources that you'd like to uh, leave people with today? So uh, there are a, a couple of pointers. First of all, uh, our marketing strategy is very simple. We give away the knowledge and information for free and hope that it will be useful for someone. Thus, if you go to our homepage, there is a link there called resources and you'll find a uh, reading list for, for data engineers with, with links and, uh, to presentations and articles and books and so forth. And, and all, all of my previous conference presentations are also there. But uh, I know that reading list is, is fairly popular and appreciated. Um, there are a couple of uh, ma many links, or many uh, of the good resources are, of course, in that list. But there are a couple of ones that I'd like to highlight. I already mentioned Data Kitchen, who's, who's providing great resources. Uh, there is a book by Harwin Ratwal. I hope I got his name right on Data Ops, and that is the best Data Ops. Uh, book out there. Um, there is also a great book by Jesse Anderson called Data Teams. And if you're a leader and uh, are interested in team formations and so forth, Jesse Anderson, who runs the Big Data Institute, mm -hmm. is, is the best resource on, on those topics. So I think those are the resources that come off the top of my head. But if and if you forget them, just reach out to me on, on Twitter, LinkedIn, or you can find my uh, some kind of mail on our homepage. So um, I, with <laughs> with my clumsiness here, I'm trying to put the link to, and I'm going to see if I pronounce it correctly. Skling, skling, skling? yes. Skling? Uh, I just found the resources uh, reading list, and I'm trying to put it into chat, and for some reason, it's not letting me add it to chat. So I just stuck it in the questions. I don't know if everyone can see this. I hope so. Um, but, I think um, there's a hangout room afterwards or something, so I can, oh, I can hang there and, and post, a, uh, post some links and so forth. We can follow up there. Uh, you got 30 seconds left. <laughs> then, then thank you very much, Ellen, for, for hosting this session. It is very much appreciated, and I hope that the, the uh, most of the questions got, got answered and, and that we uh, didn't rant too much and, and hopefully hopefully I was uh, fairly concise at least. Well, we if you're very concise and you uh, you just get me revved up as you always do. These are really interesting topics and talking to someone who has that direct experience putting them into play is, is hugely valuable. 